All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, it looks like we're all here. Uh, George texted me earlier today, and there's a family emer a medical emergency in his family, so he's not going to make it tonight. So it'll be the four of us on the Conservation Commission, uh, plenty for a quorum. Um, so I was, we've got a fairly full agenda, and I was hoping we'd be able to move through it fairly quickly, but a lot of the material for us to review today came in today, and I really haven't had a chance to review it. So we may take longer than I had hoped, and we may not be able to close the public hearing that's about to begin until we have a chance to review the material that's submitted, but we'll see how it goes. The first item on the agenda is the continuation of the public hearing for Sovereign Builders uh, proposal to, uh, to build a storage facility off a of state road. Um, we received a number of, uh, of new sub elements to the submission, uh, including a response uh, to comments that were submitted before by DEP and by us, uh, an alternatives analysis, a revised stormwater plan, and revised site plans. So I guess I just begin by asking uh, applicants to review the new material and any changes that have been made. And if you can do it in enough detail that we don't need to go back and review it uh, in hard copy, that would be great. But if it's more complicated and the commission feels like it needs more time, we would just ask to continue the hearing until next month and then we'll make a decision then. So I, I guess I should mention that this hearing is now officially open and, um, and I'll, I'll sort of ask who from the applicants would like to uh, address the new material. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Christopher Carney. Uh, I work as a civil engineer and land surveyor over at R. Lebec Associates, and I'm here tonight with Todd Zalura uh, for the proposed self-storage facility off State Road. Um, at the last meeting, uh, we had a pretty thorough design. The driveway had been reduced uh, to the appropriate width uh, and after that meeting or during that meeting, there were some comments as, uh, for removing the stormwater basin that was adjacent to the driveway. So I believe that's where we left off at the last meeting. Uh, so we were able to make those plan revisions and head to the planning board with those plan revisions and uh, sent, since then closed planning board for this project. They were able to review the driveway with the reduced width and no stormwater uh, basin next to that driveway. And, um, I, as far as I can tell, they are the stormwater authority in Waitley, but it, it's definitely, I think, in your area, possibly as well. Uh, so I'll just jump into the plan revisions and then uh, all the other additional materials. I made you a co-host, Christopher, so you can, you can share your screen if you'd like. Great, I would like to. All right, so we have a re revised site plan uh, dated June 25th. I'm gonna try to keep this quick. Um, the existing conditions is all the same and these notes are the same. We start getting into the changes as we get into the layout sheet. Previously, there was a stormwater basin here. That stormwater basin has been replaced with generally with a level spreader. So I'll Christopher, hold on a second. I'm not yet seeing your screen. I see that you started screen sharing, but I don't yet see the plan. Scott, I, I'll just Other commissioners, do you see the plan yet? Okay. Uh, no. Okay. I just turned it off and turned it on again. Any, any luck now? Sometimes there's a lag, but so far I just see it says uh, that you started sh screen sharing, but it seems like it hasn't cut, hasn't come through yet. I'll try a different one. Um, anything yet? Not yet. I 
Okay, let's see, maybe Where's I can it? share my version of it if, if yours isn't gonna work. Yeah. All right, so site revision stamped. Yes, yeah, 625, 21. And which which sheet do you want to see? Uh, C4 would be a good place to start. Then you can tell me where you would like me to zoom in. I don't know if it's a problem on my side, but I'm not seeing the site plans yet either. All right. I can see it. So it's up on my screen. Yeah, I can see the plan, Scott. Okay. I think I'm gonna request to just leave the meeting very quick and re-log into the Zoom. Okay, sure. I can't I can't see any of that screen anymore. Ann Montserrat, can you see the plan? Uh, yes, I can see it. Yes. Okay. I'm having some trouble hearing though. It's very, very quiet. Okay. And I tried headphones, but I can't get them to work. Is that true when everyone speaks or just when I speak or just when Chris speaks? Especially you, but both of you. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I was hung up definitely in my Zoom platform. So apologies. But um, as you see, the driveway apron uh, was reduced, and there's a gravel uh, shoulder to the north side of the driveway. Uh, north of that, there had been an infiltration basin, generally where that cursor was. Uh, that's been removed, and now stormwater will flow off the driveway into the gravel strip and then generally either over land or end up in the level spreader located at the far left side and far west side of the gravel strip. Uh, so you'll see that level spreader shown as a minimum of 40 feet. Uh, so that'll help keep flows from channelizing before being outlet, outletted into the adjacent wetland area. Uh, so these revisions are a direct result from comments from Planning Board Commission, or the, excuse me, Conservation Commission. And can you, can you talk about how much the uh, stormwater management material has changed as a result of that revision? In terms of cubic feet per second or uh, flow off the site? Well, I guess the question is, is that something that I'm going to need to go through the whole document again to get a sense of or is this like a minor difference that's hardly noticeable? Yeah, generally all our submission, it, it does show up as a minor different, minor change. Uh, the plans, it's really the removal of the basin. Everything else has remained the same. And really you just have a clear area inside that basin. The new additions to this plan are the level spreader substantially. And there is a detail, I believe on D7 now, that would show a, a blow up of the level spreader. But some details were removed as the infiltration basin was removed, those details were removed from the plan set. Uh, so you'll see some revisions on other sheets. And because the level spreader uh, shows up on every sheet, there's a revision date on many of the sheets. But it's all the same revision of the level spreader being added. Uh, commissioners, anybody have questions? Or comments before we move on? No. No. Okay, I think, no. I mean, that was one of the key issues that we dealt with at the previous meetings. The other one was the alternatives analysis, which I haven't had a chance to review the written version. Uh, does somebody want to walk us through that? 
Yeah, I, I certainly can. Um, I, I'd like to try to share again here. If I, could. I may have to re-designate you. Apologies for these. Okay, I believe that I've stopped sharing and made you a co-presenter or co-host. I'm really hoping you're seeing uh, my screen at this point. Yes, I see it. So we've been we prepared an alternatives analysis for this site. It's a pretty thorough alternatives analysis. Uh, it goes through first uh, an introduction into the project and then the regulatory uh, framework that requires this analysis and, and why it was performed. Um, and then we head into a section called scope of analysis. Um, much, much of this isn't really pertaining to the site, but more regulatory uh, information. Uh, we really get into the nuts of this report in this comparative market analysis. Uh, Todd was able to contact a realtor who was able to look for any comparable properties in Wakely that might be able to be used as an alternative site for this project. Uh, so after their search, they were able to come up with three prop properties in Wakely that were for sale and potentially could be used as an alternative site. I'll head right to the summary sheet because I think that provides the best look at this. Uh, the three properties are Zero River Road, Conway Road, and then on Weber Road. So I think the first comment I would make for these alternatives is that they aren't located on State Route 9. Uh, because this is a self-storage facility. You mean five and 10? Yeah, five and 10, excuse me. Uh, because it's a storage facility, one of the requirements is visibility from a major road. So I think these addresses being more remote is a hindrance to the project. Uh, once we move down past that uh, comment, we, we would look at lot size. We'd see that this lot size is uh, about an acre. We have about four and a half, we have 4.15 acres here and two and a half acres. And that really makes only this property a for area comparable uh, to the project. I think without even getting into costs of these projects, well, these other alternative properties, I think the location and the size of these uh, do not present sufficient alternatives for this project. It, is, does anyone have any questions for uh, the alternatives analysis portion of this? Okay, so um, Zero River Road is uh, less than an acre in size, so I assume that would be a problem. Um, Zero Conway Road, from the photograph, that looks like it's um, uh, right across from the West Whateley Chapel. Um, the Dickinson property that's for sale, right? Um, in which case there's a, a large portion of it that's within 400 feet of the reservoir and uh, there may be wetland issues in there as well. 105 Weber Road, 2.5 acres, I'm not familiar with that property. As well, the zoning on those parcels are residential zone. So it's not zoned for that use, that type of use. Yeah, and I'm sure it wouldn't be welcome on Conway Road or Weber Road. Okay. Um, do any of the commissioners have any questions or comments about the 
alternatives analysis? No. No. And I think a next item that we could cover would be the mass TEP comments that were received as part of this project. Okay, go ahead. Um, so as part of this, we submitted this project to mass DEP because of our uh, proximity to wetlands. Um, and Mark Stinson has reviewed the project and came up with uh, the following six comments. And I'll head right to a response letter that was prepared and submitted uh, to the Conservation Commission today. And uh, we'll cover these questions. I'll go over them one by one. Mm -hmm. uh, they, Based on aerial photos, including LIDAR data, as well as a submitted plan, it is not clear that mean annual high water line is correctly shown. With a broad floodplain and BBW, oftentimes in these situations, the mean annual, mean annual high water line is based on CMR. In some river reaches, the mean annual high water line is represented by bankful field indicators that occur above the first observable break and slope. And if no observable break and slope exists, by other bankful field indicators. These river reaches are characterized by at least two of the following features, a low gradient, meanders, oxbows, histosols, histosols, uh, a low flow channel or poorly defined or non-existent banks. Uh, 2019 aerials, as well as other years, show most of the BBW and bordering land subject to flooding to be inundated in the spring. Uh, so Ryan Nelson was able to prepare this letter. He is uh, the, the person that originally did the RDA with you and walked these mean annual high water lines and wetland flags with you. So um, the response to that comment would be the mean annual high water line is correctly shown and has it has been determined along with other on-site wetland resource areas through the request uh, for determination of applicability by the Waitley Conservation Commission in December of 2020. Yes, that's correct. It's uh, it's already been determined by the commission, and there's no uh, there's no reason and no process for revisiting that decision, uh, short of waiting the three years. So that stands. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Uh, comment number two. This is a commercial commercial project. Therefore, it would appear that the correct alternatives analysis is three ten CMR which is under consideration for practical alternatives, extends to the original parcel and the subdivided parcels, any adjacent parcels and any other land which can reasonably be obtained within the same municipality. This does not appear to have been done. The NOI states the property owner is Sharon Holick, whereas the applicant is Sovereign Builders. Uh, CMR requires the owner to be the applicant for that person to implement the project purpose. Therefore, the submitted alternat uh, alternatives analysis fails unless sovereign builders owned the property on August 7, 1996. So um, we acknowledge that uh, Todd does not own that property. So we did prepare the required alternatives analysis that was just discussed. Okay. Comment number three, the narrative states that the driveway access is being submitted as a limited project under uh, 310 CMR. However, that should have been checked off on form three of DEP guidance on this limited project and will be provided to the parties. The limited project can only apply if the entirety of the project purpose is located outside of the riverfront in the uplands. Since that is not the case, then the limited project does not apply and full compliance with the riverfront standard is required and the project as proposed exceeds 10% of the riverfront on the property, which is not allowable. Um, our response to that comment would be the project layout has been revised such that the project purpose is located outside of the riverfront area. The only work to occur within the riverfront area consists of the stream and BBW crossing and the requisite BBW uh, replication area. And, and of course the access driveway. An updated WPA form three will be provided citing the correct limited project provisions. Has that form been provided? Uh, not, I, it wasn't included in the submission today to you. Okay. So I think that at previous meetings, we had already discussed this issue and that 
um, we consider the road to be the limited project. And now that you've removed the infiltration basin, I think that removes the whole uh, issue that Mark was concerned with that. Uh, so I think that's settled. It's just that uh, given that you've reduced the width of the road and eliminated that infiltration basin, the, the number of square feet that you are altering is different. And we need to, I need those numbers in order to fill out the order of conditions uh, form. Yep. So you'll need so, to get that to me. Yeah, as the project moved along, uh, we do have this riverfront area calculation provided on sheet C4, and it has been adjusted to uh, show the new values for the new roadway. It is still over the 10% threshold, but it's been reduced greatly from the original submission. And okay. uh, just one last note would be, this would be the 200 riverfront area. And we have uh, been careful to keep all parts of the purpose of this project outside of this 200 foot riverfront area. Only the driveway and BB, the crossing are inside the riverfront area. So that uh, 200 foot would be the limit of work? Um, I mean, the limit of work will have to encompass the driveway as well, but for the purpose right. of the project. Yes, it is the limit of work for the purpose. Okay. So if we were to ask you to flag that 200 feet as the limit of work, you would be able to respect that during construction? Absolutely. And there is a silt fence proposed uh, along the 200 foot setback. Okay. Which that'll indicate, you know, and keep construction outside of the riverfront area. Okay, go ahead and proceed. Uh, please show on the plan where bankful measurements were taken and how average bankful width was derived. Uh, please refer to sheet D6A of the revised plan set, which shows a cross section of the stream crossing depicted both existing and proposed conditions. The majority of the stream crossing footprint will, will replace an existing 36 inch diameter cast iron culvert. However, under proposed conditions, the crossing will be widened and span a segment of stream beyond the existing culvert height. At the southerly end of the crossing, the max bank foot width dimension of the existing stream is eight feet. 1.2 times the bank full width of eight feet would be 9.6 feet. The proposed open bo bottom box culvert will have an inside opening width of 10 feet. So that exceeds the requirement. And we can look at uh, sheet D6. Uh, this would show these cross sections. We'll show the existing grade at the crossing as well as the proposed grade at the crossing. That's a cross section of the structure. I think the question had to do with when you decided what bankful width was to determine how wide the replacement structure needs to be, where were those measurements of bankful width that you used to determine the size of the structure? At the bank full width would be at the openings of the culverts and uh, yes, here, here at the opening and here at this opening. Yeah, that that's not acceptable. Uh, generally, the bank full width associated with undersized structures is is not uh, an accurate sense of what the bank full width of the stream channel is, and you need to go upstream or and or downstream about you know anywhere from five to ten bankful widths upstream and downstream in order to get to an unaltered unaffected portion of the stream channel i i un understood and I'm, i need to revise my original comment the bankful width on the southern end was on at this section here which was eight feet i believe that's what ryan had mentioned in his comment here at the southerly end of the crossing, the maximum big full width dimension of the existing stream is eight feet. Uh, and that would be shown, excuse me, I'm sorry for that uh, incorrect pointing before, but this would be the eight feet. Uh, this opening for the box culvert is the dashed line to the dashed line that would represent 10 feet. And then this dashed line, uh, which is approximately 12 feet from the bottom of the culvert uh, would represent the eight feet multiplied by 1.2, that would be the 9.6. So I guess to answer that question correctly, the bank full width measurements were taken here.
Okay. Um, yeah, so that that comment has not been satisfied uh, from DEP. It's still outstanding. Um, because even though you've, you've told us where the bank full widths are, that's not the place where they should have been measured. They should have been measured farther upstream and further downstream from that. Okay. Um, when you say further upstream and downstream, um, is there an approximate distance you're looking for? Uh, well, if you're guessing that the bank full width is somewhere around eight feet, then you would want to be somewhere like 80 feet upstream and 80 feet downstream. But the key thing is to find a section of the channel that is unaffected by the existing crossing and that is relatively straight. You don't generally measure it on a curve. You measure it on a fairly straight section. You generally take three measurements and average them. So three measurements below an average, three measurements above an average, and then take the average of upstream and downstream. My guess is you're actually going to end up with a bank full width that's less than eight feet, because generally there's some kind of a scour pool at the outlet of an of a undersized structure. But we don't know that until somebody actually goes out and, and, and does that measurement. Yeah. Uh, apologies for not knowing these regulations better, but uh, Ryan, Ryan probably knows how to make those measurements appropriately. Uh, so I guess we can provide supplemental information. Okay. As All right, you wanna move on to five? In order to provide appropriate water depths and velocities at a variety of flows and especially low flows, it is necessary to preserve or reconstruct the, the stream bed within the structure. It is important that a continuous thelweg, deepest portion of the channel, be maintained through the structure. When constructing the stream bed, special attention should be paid to the sizing and arrangement of materials within the structure. Understood, the stream bed underneath the proposed crossing will be constructed to maintain a continuous thelweg through the structure as opposed to a broad flat surface without channelized flow. Uh, that, that's contained on the same detail that we were looking at before. Uh, it shows a, a thelweg. Yeah. And how, do you, how are you gonna create that thelweg? Um, I, some of it will be through the, the removal of the culvert. Uh, that will definitely present a natural opportunity for us to create a thelweg. Outside of that, there is a, a, an already existing uh, flow. And since this is open bottom box culvert, it can be placed um, right over the existing stream bed. I can zoom in on that. And the stream, the current stream bed is made up of what kind of material? Is, is it? Unconsolidated material, silts, uh, sands, is it rocky? Um, are you going to, how are you going to maintain the shape of it? Is there going to be uh, rock banks that are put in there in order to confine the, the flow? Uh, you have a fairly wide wetland above it. And so when you get higher flows, you're going to get a concentration of flow through the structure. So you're probably going to need to have some way of making sure that that doesn't scour out uh, the channel inside the structure when you get a five-year storm, 10-year storm that's well above bankful width. So we're going to need more detail on how you're going to construct the channel inside that structure. Okay, we can provide the uh, flow numbers and the required, I'm guessing you're looking for a riprap size or stone size to be placed inside the river? Yeah, and generally you can create um, sort of banks made out of rocks that are, that are then buried in other material, but that those rocks are stable even under high flows so that they're not going to be flushed out of the system. Um, uh, and that way you can avoid the channel becoming overly wide if there's a concentrated flow uh, put through there uh, because an overly wide channel is going to be too shallow at um, at at low low water flows. 
Yes, as I look at this plan, it seems like the box culvert would span the existing crossing at the southerly end of the culvert, but the northerly end uh, and, and really the cell wag is offset from the culvert. So uh, we can provide better construction details. Yeah, and I would refer you to, um, I mean, the, the manual for doing these kinds of bed constructions is the US Forest Service's stream simulation manual. Um, and it's a very detailed thing, but if you go to the appropriate chapters in that manual, you will get plenty of guidance in terms of how to design it and then how those designs could be presented to us for review. Um, US Forest Service. Yeah, stream simulation manual. Uh, I believe that I, I have a copy of that let me see. If you go to streamcontinuity.org slash NAACC, um, and you go to resources and documents, down near the bottom is the uh, US Forest Service Stream Simulation Manual. We have any trouble we'll, we'll reach out to you okay um, i mean as far also the, the 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 division of ecological restoration the massachusetts division of ecological restoration has a lot of resources available as well so you could go to their website and look for guidance there as well as far as erosion controls in this area we are uh, proposing these straw waddles uh, as well as hay bales across the opening at certain times i believe hay bales Okay. So now we're to the last comment, number six. Uh, per volume one, chapter one of the stormwater handbook, the construction period erosion, sedimentation and pollution prevention plan must identify all stormwater management activities that are needed during the land disturbance and construction, including source control and pollution prevention measures. EMPs to address erosion, <laughs> stabilize measures and procedures for operating and maintaining the BMPs, especially in response to the wet weather events and frost. The plan shall include a schedule for sequencing construction and stormwater management activities that minimize land disturbance by ensuring that vegetation is preserved to the maximum extent practical and the disturbed portions of the site are stabilized as quickly as possible. The PMPs used during construction must be different from the BMPs that we'll use to handle stormwater after construction is complete and the site is stabilized. Uh, many stormwater technologies and filtration technologies are not designed to handle high concentrations of sediments typically found in construction runoff and thus must be protected from construction related sediment loading. Uh, understood, uh, the stormwater prevention plans, the SWIP and the EPA uh, NPDS construction genuine general permit will be prepared for the, pro for the proposed project prior to construction. And this will outline the best management practices and erosion control methods during construction to protect adjacent wetland resource areas and to prevent sedimentation of the pro proposed stormwater management system structures. Okay, usually the way that we handle that is that we put as a condition in the order of conditions that uh, that SWIP and the NIPTES permit material be submitted and reviewed and approved by the Conservation Commission before construction can begin. Uh, members of the commission, do you have any questions or comments about all uh, about this document? No, nope. you covered all topics. No questions. No questions. Okay. Um, is there anybody else uh, participating in the meeting that would like to make a comment or a question or ask a question? Okay, Christopher, do you have anything else you'd like to present at this time? We have the stormwater drainage report that's been revised for the removal of the infiltration basin, but. Um, I don't think it's worth going through this document. It's very lengthy and right. really the removal of the basin. But all the requisite calculations for the stormwater management system would be found inside this. 
Okay, I agree. <coughs> All right, so based on my memory of what everything we've just discussed, the the primary outstanding information that we need is related to the design of the crossing. And it, it includes um, better uh, measurement of bank full width and more detail about the design of the channel that's going to be within that structure in order to maintain flows and water depths at a variety of uh, um, velocities and, and water depths at a variety of flows. Um, so I would propose that we continue the hearing with your permission uh, until our next meeting next month. And, uh, and at that time, if you have the material ready, we will review it. And uh, perhaps at that point, we'll be ready to make a decision. Any, uh, any other comments from the commissioners? Any comments from the applicants? All right, um, that sort of brings us to an issue about when our next meeting is going to be. Generally, we have to move that meeting in August in order to accommodate vacation plans. For me, the best date for that meeting would be the 25th. Uh, Andrew, Montserrat, Anne, how does that look for you? Fine for right now. I don't see anything on the, that far out. So. Hold on, checking. Okay. Looks okay to me. Got. Okay. Just, just a question while while we're here. Sorry to yep. interrupt. Is there any chance we would we would have the meeting earlier in the month rather than later if we could get the information to you relatively soon within within a week or so? Is there any chance rather than wait another month for what I feel like is are some details that need to be worked out, but I think that we can get to them pretty quickly. Well, um, the the only other time besides that week that would work for me is the first week in August. And I don't know whether you will have the time necessary to do the design work. Chris, can, can you answer that? Um. We, I mean, based on the current amount of rain we've had, studying that stream is going to be difficult, but we do have a lot of topography and cross sections of that stream, as well as the mean annual high water line. So I think we can do the bank full width just by utilizing the existing conditions plan. We would uh, generally like to have somebody involved in the design that is, has done a design before a uh, stream simulation design. Um, so that would make us feel more confident if you can find somebody to work with you to make sure that what you put together is actually going to work. Yeah, th this project is a, uh, the whole team at RLA works on this project and we all have our, our areas of expertise I've done stream crossings before, but I'm certainly not the expert. Uh, this stream crossing definitely represents a team effort, and I might not be the best team member to present the details for this crossing. Uh, I guess ultimately what I'm trying to get at is that uh, a lot of thought and care was taken and put into this design. So, um so the next option would be to like two weeks from tonight. Do you think you can be ready for two weeks tonight if we were to schedule a special meeting? Yes. All right, and Andrew Mont Montserrat, how does uh, August 4th look to you? Yes, I can do that. Just a sec. If it's a Zoom, it shouldn't be any problem, yeah. Sure, I can do that. All right, let me just check the town of Waitley calendar. All 
All right, I don't see anything on the calendar for August 4th. So <clears throat> with your permission, uh, the applicant needs to give us permission in order to extend this hearing. We'd like to continue the hearing till 7 p.m. on August 4th uh, and conduct it again remotely via Zoom. That's acceptable, correct, Todd? Yes, definitely. Thank you all for being willing to have a special meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, any last questions or comments before we uh, shut this down for this week and, and pick it up again on the 4th? No, I believe we'll do this, the thankful measurement as well as the updated construction for the proposed Delwig. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll close that for tonight, but not officially close the hearing uh, it will be continued <clears throat> until August 4th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. <clears throat> Next up on the agenda is the uh, request for certificate of compliance for the Long Plain Solar. Uh, Tony, you there? I am here. Sorry that we uh, kept you so long waiting. I wasn't expecting to spend as much time on this. Uh, no, no problem. All right. So, Tony, you've submitted. Uh, a plan that shows uh, grades and indicated your opinion about what to do about the stormwater management for that site. And I forwarded that information to the other commissioners. Would you like to just sort of summarize what it is that you proposed? Yeah, I, um, um, well, after our meeting out there, we, um, I, I think we're comfortable how we, um, solve the approach of the driveway coming in and, um, and uh, uh, remove the ponding that we had when we had our first um, site visit out there in the beginning of the spring. Um, but at that meeting, um, when we talked, Scott, you had some concerns um, um, farther up the road heading towards the solar array and um, kind of at the edge of the lawn and the clover field and um, so I, I mean, it's our goal there always with the design was to keep that natural grade. Once we um, reshaped that and removed our lay down area there um, was to uh, just reshape down, let the water flow like it always had from the field there um, across the um, road drive to get in. Now that access drive road is gravel um, now where it was uh, pretty much dirt, I believe before. But um, so, um, so you had concerns um, uh, about that and you wanted me to look at whether it'd be good to maybe channelize that and bring it uh, up there, you know, pick off water and um, channelize it and direct it there as opposed to letting it get farther down. And um, it was pretty hard to tell um, without actually shooting some additional topo there. And when we did that, it was very evident to me that the water that's coming there, and if you can remember when we were there in the spring, it was moving pretty slow through the field and um, was over a spread out fashion. Although there was a collection down in the driveway, that may still be happening. I, I was out there today and it, it looked like things were had drained pretty well without any erosion or scour. Um, so based on the shots that uh, we took, it looks like the water you know, as we thought it should do, uh, spread out and move very slowly. That, that field is only, the grade in that field is about seven tenths to nine tenths of a percent. Um, and then it looks like it gathers for about three inches along a strip below point on the north side of the driveway. And if we get more than that, it would cross the driveway and, and over a spread out fashion and then drain towards the brook. So um, I think the way that it is functioning right now, in my opinion, and even looking at it today after we've almost had 12 inches of rain um, this month of July, I would tend to think that this is probably um, the best way to go. I, in my opinion, I think sometimes if you try to do some things, you cause more issues. Um, I'm not in favor of trying to create a diversion ditch and a channel and um, 
either dip in the road or um, putting in a culvert. The other thing is we do have the underground electric running along the west side of that drive up to um, the equipment within the array. So um, I don't know, Scott, if you had a chance to get out there and look at it recently, but it's it really looks like um, it's functioning as we intended as a more spread out and just as that field naturally did was once it got out of the row crops was just a drain in a very spread out flat fashion to the stream. So I was pretty comfortable what I saw today, but um, you know, obviously uh, um, we will listen to um, any of the commission concerns on this. Yeah, I have not gotten out there to take a look at the site. I don't know if any other commissioners have had a chance to drive by or to look at it. No. I drove by today. It looked um, it looked pretty dry. I didn't I didn't notice a big uh, puddle there. Okay. Tony, what about the farm road? Had have you looked at that it's after all this rain? It's it's grooved. I mean, they're bringing tractors in there, but we don't. I don't know if I have control over what to do there. I mean, it didn't. I mean, there was not any erosion or sediment crossing um, the the driveway getting to the stream. But it's it's a dirt farm road. I mean, they're running tractors over that. So based on all the rain that we had, I you know you would expect it to even be worse than it was. But it 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 had more grooves than the, than when we were out there, Scott. I mean, they're getting to the field on the east side of the array. That's that's how they're accessing that. I'm not sure if they did that years ago or not. Um, when we did our survey, I didn't notice that. And my other site visits, I didn't know that crossing, but they might might have done something else, brought it up closer to the array or something. I mean, they're running right through that lawn area. Um, so it was um, somewhat worse today, but it didn't look like flow was carrying sediment from that that dirt, oh, um, that dry uh, um, farm access across the road towards the stream. I mean, it looked it looked good to me. Yeah, I think that's my biggest concern right now is is that if the water is not managed to cross the road higher up to the to the north, then it has to cross that farm road and create the potential for you know a little, you know. Uh, erosion there that might muddy the water before it enters that little brook. Yeah. Um, I mean, looking at the topo though, um, I don't think it gets that way. The grades, I mean, obviously we don't shoot it every foot and you can look at the, cause I gave you both exhibits, one with just the contours and the other ones with the shots. And you can see that by the spruce tree, that area seems to be higher than the farm road and the actual low point from the you know draining from the clover area and that um, is lower in that spot so it would drain there before and then when it built up it crossed the road in a very spread out fashion so i mean that's how we would design like a sediment trap anyways but naturally it's it's doing that um but i don't know how to you know tell the farmers you can't go over there and you have to figure out a different way to get into your field i i don't know how to I mean, I don't, I mean, Jen Duckett from Nexianth is on the call. She might know if they have an agreement with who's doing that and whether they're, you know, maybe could put some stone down there or something to um, do that. I mean, I think that's would, would be the, the thing is to put maybe some stone down there. But, um, you know, a portion of that we don't, we own, but a portion of it we don't. I mean, they cross, um, um, the Gripco property up at the corner. So, I mean, it shows right on that exhibit because I had my surveyor pick it up. Yeah. So, I mean, well, that I mean, that, that's an option. I guess that's an option worth considering if that's something that you think you could do. I mean, if you could address the farm road question by putting some stone down so that we don't have to worry about it turning into a wallow when we yeah. get a wet period and and you know the rain we've got is a pretty good test but the springtime is an even more severe test of that where there's a lot less vegetation right. uh, so i don't know um is that something you can look into 
Um, well, I can ask Nexamp um, if they would be interested in doing that, but that would be the any solution there just to stabilize that, make it a little harder surface so that the, you know, the um, tractors don't start to rut it out. But I, I think if they rut it out, it's going to cause a, a ponding there. It's not, I'm not concerned about the stream because it's got a distance and I think it'll be lower than the hardened surface drive that we have to get into the array. And a lot of the area, if you go back there and you drive that drive up to the up to the when you get to the area of the um, uh, of the array right in front where the wood fence is there you can see that a lot of that water from the solar field gets peeled off over there I mean, there's a depression in the drive that we have and um, and it's swelling in it and a lot of that peels off and spreads out through um, where Mr. Hutkowski has uh, uh, you know still uh, farm equipment and stuff out there so a good portion gets peeled off there. We do have some here, but it, you know, it, it really looked good to me. I didn't see anything that was, um, you know, staining or causing, you know, would make you believe that, you know, things were getting, um, you know, sedimented across the drive. I mean, the vegetation's pretty tall in there, you know. Um, and so I, I think anything that's getting through there is probably pretty clean getting to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's something, I don't know if Jen, you want to get on, you want to talk whether you can put a little stone down at the beginning, maybe 20 feet back from, from the edge of our drive, um, agree to that. Maybe, maybe the commission would um, be acceptable in granting your um, certificate of compliance. I, um, this is Jennifer Duquette with Nexamp. I'm the project manager for this project. Um, I just pulled up my project drawings to try to get a better idea of the, um, the lease limits of this project. And I do not believe that I have any jurisdiction to do work on that farm road. Um, my jurisdiction would only apply to my access road and anything that falls within our lease limits. Um, so I don't believe that is something that I can do without permission of the landowner. Um, I'm more than willing to reach out to him to see if that's something that, that they would like for us to take care of. But unfortunately, I'm unable to speak to that piece of property at this time. And do you, who's the landowner? Yeah, I, I mean, Jen might not know this. Um, it was at the time when we permitted this project, uh, the Hutkowski family still own it. It was Scott and I forget, probably his brother. Um, but since Wayne. that time, I think Nexamp purchased this property. It might be in a different entity, Jen, but I, I believe Nexamp purchased it out of auction. I, I don't know the details of that because I don't get involved in that. Um, um, Fortunately, I was not the project manager yeah. when this was yeah. built. Um, I'm taking over the... Yeah very last minute. So I can certainly look into that um, with our um, um, with our departments to see if that's something that we are able to do. And if, if that's something that I do have authorization to do, I have no issue putting some some compacted gravel. Um, you said the first 20 feet or so of that yeah. farm road? I mean, do you think that's fine, Scott? Just getting a road like, like the first 20, 25 feet back off the off the edge of our drive? Um, I can't go too yeah. far. I don't want to. I don't want to get into Ms. Mrs. Gripko's property. I mean, I don't think we can do that. Right. No. I mean, I think what I'm more interested in is where that swale crosses the road. If that could be stone, so that it doesn't turn into a mud wallow, I think that would satisfy me. Yeah, I don't and, think it goes that way. I think it goes from from the road back to. Um, well, it might cross there a little bit, but I think I think we have. Um, in the swale part, um, I mean, the road, our driveway is higher than that. And the spruce in that area there is higher than that. So it might, I'm thinking the more they ride the, gut, the rutted, it's gonna, the water's gonna sit there and it might even take over for the, which call it. So what I wouldn't do is if we put in the stone, I would not um, excavate anything. I would put some, just a little bit of fabric down and I would go over the top of it so it's built up. So it stays on the north side of that farm road in the east side, so it sits there, infiltrates, and then if it gets too much, then it goes over the road, and then the driveway is acting like a pretty long level spreader, 
And right. once and it gets across there, then it's very spread out to the to the stream, which is something we would want. Yeah, and it would carry less sediment with it because you've stabilized the road part and it won't be right. uh, you know, loose mud. Right. Yeah, I, if you would be willing to look into that, I would, I would think that that would be a wise way to go. And I think that would be an easy way to satisfy me. Uh, I ask at this point, other commissioners, what you think. Oh, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I'm okay with that too. And uh, me as well. Okay. So is that a plan? You'll look into it. I recognize that you can't say yes now, but you can ask the landowner or you can check the records to see if you actually own the land and then uh, let us know. Yeah, and then, then if we can do that, then um, hopefully we'll just take a picture and send it to you and you guys in your next meeting, you could do that. And then I don't have to attend or anything. And unless you have an issue, then you probably could reach out to me, but um, yeah, I, I think just that's... want to get this finished off. That's all. You know, yeah, I, I think that's everybody. fine. Okay. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you all. Thank you. And um, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jen. Um, all right. Next up, as we move our way through this stuff slowly but surely, is the request for determination of applicability by Waitley RE Holdings LLC to confirm the boundaries of resource areas at uh, 23A LaSalle Drive. Um, uh, the commissioners, I've forwarded to you earlier today the uh, the RDA and the new site plan. Um, it looks to me like the modifications that we had asked for are have been appropriately done on the new plan. Um, and so, I mean, we could ask you, Christopher, for a presentation, but I think we're probably pretty close to saying uh, voting on it and letting it and moving forward. Uh, any, the commissioners have any comments or questions about where we are with this? I fix that a little bit, then I, I think we're good. Thank you guys. This is uh, Chris. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time to come out to the site and look at it. And um, um, happy to answer any questions that you have, but I think I agree that we're, we should be all right to go here. Does anybody else participating in the meeting have any comments or questions, any members of the public that would like to speak? All right, well, in that case, I would propose that we issue a positive determination of applicability that confirms the boundaries of the resource areas as they are defined on the most recent plan. Um, so, Commissioners, how do you vote? Aye. And aye. Monter Montserrat? Aye. Andrew? Aye. I vote yes as well. Uh, so in that case, we're finished. We can issue that. I assume we will see you again when you get ready to actually file for a notice of intent to work on the property. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But at least you now know what the boundaries of the resource areas are and you can work around those. It's going to take a little bit of time for me to gather signatures to get this in the mail to you, but I will try to get it out to you as soon as I can. Great. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, I have to commend you on the work that you you all do. It's uh, it's pretty pretty positive stuff. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Next up is a request for a certificate of compliance submitted by Backyard ADU. ADUs for the construction of a accessory dwelling at 148 Westbrook Road. Um, this morning, Montserrat and I went out and did a site visit to confirm that they had roped off this area that was uh, designated as a restoration area in exchange for the alterations to riverfront area in putting in that, uh, that dwelling unit. Uh, I believe we found it satisfactory, right, Montserrat? And I reviewed the uh, order of conditions and we made no requirement that that be monumented. So uh, what has been done now seems to be uh, in compliance. So I would recommend the issuance of a certificate of compliance. Any questions or comments or opinions, refutations? <laughs> 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 
All right. So the question before us is to issue a certificate of compliance for that project. Um, all in favor, Anne? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Montserrat? Aye. And I vote yes. Uh, and so uh, we will issue a certificate of compliance as soon as I can get signatures. So I know I didn't give the applicants much chance to talk. If you want to talk, you're welcome to talk now, but I think it was a pretty easy one for us to deal with. All right. Um, there's no further comments. We are done with that one. The uh, That brings us to updates and other business. Um, Justin, are you with us? Somebody there with a the phone number. I think I muted them because it was Hello? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear, hear me you. now? Okay, this is Justin Baronas. Hi, Justin. Um, uh, why don't you explain your situation at, uh, with the well that you are that you need to put in on your property there on Conway Road? Okay, so I have an existing shallow well that's eight feet deep uh, that I'm going to be abandoning and drilling a new well uh, farther away from the brook uh, close to my I guess it's going to be in the grass right on the edge of my driveway uh, that abuts Conway Road. It's probably 30 feet off of Conway Road. Uh, so during this process, they're going to have to drill a, or they're going to have to, I have to dig a pit. It'll be surrounded by a silt fence. So they have like a place for mud and for the water to go. So it won't discharge down the hill towards the brook. Um, after that process is done, that'll be filled the i will put uh erosion blanket over the seed after i'm done backfilling and then after that is done uh i will dig a trench and hook up the wiring and the plumbing to the house and that will be completed within a uh, one day period the trench process okay um, and how far did you say that the, the new well site would be from the mill, uh, the uh, Westbrook? I think it's a hundred, I, I, I don't have the email in front of me, but I believe when I measured it, it was 190 feet. The old well is about 75 feet probably. Okay. So, um, I just pulled up an image that I'm going to share. I don't know if you'll see it or not, Justin, but, uh, it's it'll it's an aerial photograph of the property, and so you said it's up towards the garage, right along the driveway. Yep, right where uh, if you see the aerial photograph, it's right. It's going to be the well head is going to be right on the edge of the driveway that parallels the road. Yeah, so the uh, the driveway that goes to the garage, or the driveway that goes right. to the house, which one? Yeah, the so they'll have to pull, they'll pull the drill in to the garage and back up to that grassy area uh, that's right next to the walkway, basically right above my walkway. Okay. So um, uh, my, you know, this is not explicitly listed in the regulations as a minor activity, but when the regulations describe minor activity, it says, such as, and then it gives examples like decks and patios and swimming pools. And I feel like when an activity is going to have less impact than a deck or a swimming pool or comparable impacts, and it occurs within the areas in which minor activities are allowed, that we have the discretion to consider those uh, that, act, that, that work to be a minor activity. So. Uh, I guess that's the question before us is, are we comfortable considering this a minor activity that does not require a filing with the Conservation Commission? Yes. I think so. I agree. Okay. And uh, so Justin, you have the all clear to proceed, uh, provided that you take whatever steps are necessary to protect the Westbrook from erosion and, and sedimentation. Um, also, Justin has a few trees around his property that, he, that he's concerned about and would like to remove. Do you want to tell us a little bit about where those trees are and we can make that decision at the same time? Okay, so there's one tree on the bank between, 
Uh, are you looking at the aerial photo now? or? Yep. So basically, uh, if you went from like my garage down the hill about uh, 10 feet, there's a poplar tree. The inside of it is all rotted out. So the only thing that's holding it right now is the outer bark, maybe like three inches of meat around the outside. Uh, so I'd like to remove that one just for safety purposes around the house, you know, uh, so it doesn't fall on my kids or anything like that. How far um, is it from also, the bank, from the, the brook itself? Uh, from the brook, and this is an estimate, I'm going to say probably 80 feet. So there's a bank uh, flat of yard that probably mm-hmm. extends probably 50 feet, and then the brook bank starts after that. So it okay. goes... Uh, bank, uh, flat, and then brook. And there, there is other trees next to it. So by cutting this tree, it's going to open up uh, more canopy for the next tree that's right next to it to grow up too. So uh, as far as erosion, I don't think it's going to really impact it because of the root structure is still going to be there until the next one kind of fills its spot. Okay. Um, and then there is also a black birch, uh, during the construction of the garage, I tried to leave it. Um, but it keeps growing kind of over my garage. So I'd like to remove that one too. And that one's about eight inches at the base in diameter. Um, but it keeps like, I, I don't know, maybe we impacted it too much when during excavation, but it just doesn't seem to be doing very healthy. Okay. Um, Commissioners, how do you feel about uh, Justin removing those two trees? Fine, as long as it leaves the stump and everything, kind of, yeah, stabilize the banks should be fine. I don't, I don't see an issue. Yeah, I'm okay with that too. Okay, so am I. All right, Justin, you got the green light on both of those. Um, Thanks for taking the time to uh, to phone in from wherever you are. Uh, and sorry that you had to wait so long, but I didn't expect that public hearing to have to go 40 minutes uh, before we could move on to the rest of the agenda. Uh, no problem at all. Thank you guys very much for your time. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thanks again, bye. Okay, so then the second update slash other business has to do with this um, this proposal to remove the uh, land of the Full Bloom Market Garden LLC uh, from Chapter 61, <clears throat> probably 61A, is, yeah, 61A, uh, because it's uh, being purchased by uh, this Mustang Waitley's investors, and I believe it's to uh, to grow cannabis and or industrial hemp. And that this is the site that we did walk once before when uh, they were talking about doing a cannabis there. It's right, I believe, on the corner of, of uh, 5 and 10 in Christian Lane. Mm-hmm. Um, because this is an agricultural area, my sense would be that the appropriate thing for us to do is to defer to the Ag Commission to decide whether the town should exercise a right of first refusal um, also, I think it's going to probably not be an issue because it's going to be one kind of agricultural product or production uh, to another. But um, what do you think about the question of whether the town should exercise its right of first refusal? If it's I'm still considered you know, agriculture, do they they just want to change it to a commercial zoning? Or I'm not I'm not certain here. It's just the sale of the property. They're not oh. talking about changing zoning or use of it. They're just, it's changing hands. And whenever that happens on a chapter 61, 61A or 61B property, the town has the right to step in and buy it instead. Oh. So uh, sometimes where there's really valuable land uh, for conservation or for water resource protection, drinking water, whatever, it gives the town a chance to grab that property uh, the right of first refusal, essentially. So I don't understand why we're involved. Uh, well, generally, this is a decision that the select board makes, but they should make it in consultation with the Conservation Commission and the Ag Commission. 
because we're the ones that should be, you know, looking out for opportunities for conservation. And uh, in the past, it's been, it hasn't been a clear process, but now the select board is trying to be more routinely to consult with the two commissions before they sign off on that right of first refusal. Okay. With, with our ruling on that property we did before, now that is changing hands, we'll still, our still conditions still apply to that new landowner. You know, all that where they have to build a gate and all the whatever we design or designated, I should say. Yep. Unless they want to do something different, then they would come back to us. And okay. I don't remember whether it was a notice of intent or an RDA that we that we signed off on. I think it was just mostly the gate or something security by the book there. I think it was mostly right. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, an existing access point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, any new owner that wants to abide by the original plans and the original order of conditions can can go forward with that. Uh, if uh, if anything is different, then they would potentially need to come to us. It's got 12 million. <laughs> what do you think, Ann? Well, uh, I since it's not changing use really, I mean it's still an agriculture. I don't have any. Um, I guess I wouldn't recommend that the town get involved with the first right of refusal at this point. Monty? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Defer and to let, that. And let the Ag Commission get involved as well. You know, that makes sense. Andy? I don't think, they, I don't think the town has 12 million to spend. No. Yeah. Right. I mean, it probably would be, would require, you know, like a pre acquisition by a land trust and then try to get APR or something on it. I, I'm not quite sure how that would go, but. At this point, if the Ag Commission wanted to pursue it, I think that we could potentially support that, but I would defer to them on whether this is something that warrants that kind of action. Uh, and I don't know what they're thinking about it at this point. So, are you, so then it's okay for me to relay back to Brian that we defer to the Ag Commission on whether this right of first refusal should be exercised or waived? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then that brings us to the minutes. How do the minutes look to you all from but, last um, week? Was the other project too you said, was that in our jurisdiction, that Sugarloaf shops or no? I don't think so. I don't think that, and I mean, yeah. there is a wetland that comes somewhat nearby, but I mean, I think they're just reusing buildings and parking lots that are already yeah, there. Like yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess there's not enough pot shops in the valley yet. We need a few more. <laughs> Waitley, solar and pot shops. All right. Is there any other business that you folks or issues that you'd like to raise? Any concerns? Nope. So our meeting on the fourth replaces the one that's later in the month. That's a or good question. A special meeting. Don't we have to schedule our regular meeting? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think that if we were to meet on the fourth, not meeting again until the third week in September might be a little bit too long. So I would suggest we, we plan to meet the fourth and the, the 25th and hope that nothing comes through that, that this meeting will be short on the 25th because we'll resolve everything on the fourth. Okay. <laughs> Here's hoping. Yeah, here's for hoping, right? So I'll 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 ask the town to to book the book us on the calendar and reserve us the Zoom account so that we can do those both as remote meetings. Good. Okay. All right, then. If there's nothing more. We can wrap this meeting up, and uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, All right. You just gotta leave the signatures in the town office. Oh yeah, right. I'll I'll send out an email when it's when the paperwork is ready at the town offices, and just let me know when the signatures are all in place, and I'll I'll move it from there. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks. All Thanks. right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.